Thank you so much, Bell Choir. Well, good morning. And welcome to Watkins United Methodist Church. We're so glad you're here to worship with us, whether you are here in person or you're joining us online. We are honored for your presence. My name is Rob Tucker, and I'm blessed to be the lead pastor here at the church. A couple announcements before we continue in worship this morning is today is not October 30th and is not a fifth Sunday, but today is our Children's Home Sunday. And so you'll find that in your bulletins in front of us. We have a guest preacher this morning, and she's the VP of Development at the Kentucky United Methodist Children's Home. So we welcome Alinda Rouse Smith to our worship this morning and are very excited um, for her preaching and an inspirational moment up here to give us an update on what's going on and how we can become involved in that great place. There are, is a uh, table out there with some other stuff that you are able to come and to uh, learn more about the Kentucky United Methodist Children's Homes, um, and we encourage you to stop by that after worship. Melinda will be out there with me um, to be able to welcome you. Also, you may have noticed when you pulled in that there were some lovely things on our front lawn, right? And those are? Pumpkins! Pumpkins, and so we have turned into the Pumpkin Church And so I am so grateful for all the folks that helped us unload yesterday. And so if you were one of those, thank you so much for doing that with us. Um, We had about 50, 60 people out there unloading pumpkins from the church, from Boy Scouts. And and it really took an hour and a half. It was amazing to unload that many pumpkins in that short amount of time. So thank you for that. If you'd like to be involved in selling pumpkins, there is an online sign-up sheet on our email, or you may contact the church office. So give Cindy a call and say, hey, I, I'd be in for selling some pumpkins, and so I encourage you to do so. Also in your uh, bulletin this morning was a flyer for our Trunk or Treat and Fall Festival coming up. Did you get one of these last week? Yes. Yes, yes, you, you did. And now you have another one. What do you think you're supposed to do with the other one? Give it away. And so I encourage you to give it away. Give it to a person. Put it on your bulletin board or wherever you live. You know, make sure this word gets out to invite somebody to come join with you at the fall festival. We still need trunks for our trunk or treats. And so there is a sign-up sheet out there. Pastor Colin will be available to chat with you to talk about that. There is a competition of the best trunk, of course. Um, and I said, it's not good enough just for bragging rights. I need a trophy. And so Colin is working on that trophy. And make sure people are honored, you know, with the amount of work. And so you may lose to me, and that's okay, but we'll see. Um, so join us, trunk or treat. Fall Festival coming up in just a few weeks. Now, with all that being said, may you stand as you are able and join me in this morning's call to worship. Children of God, welcome. Welcome to this place of hope and perseverance. God invites all of us to share in the good news. In gratitude for all of this, let us worship God. Now may you stand, remain standing for us as we sing our opening hymn, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us.
May we join together this morning's affirmation of faith found in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. invite you to pass the peace of Jesus Christ with those around you. The scripture reading today comes from Psalm 66, verses 1 through 12. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Come and see what God has done, his awesome deeds for mankind. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. Praise our God, our peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over our heads and went through fire and water. But you brought us to a place of abundance. 
This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Prayers can be spontaneous or deeply contemplated. Prayers can stem from scripture or such as the beautiful Psalm 66 just read or from the morning news. Prayers express long ago experiences or the joy that morning has broken like the first morning leading us to praise with elation Praising every morning God's recreation of the new day. And prayers can be inspired by the sight of pumpkins ready to sell in support of our church's mission. My prayer this morning reflects two recent experiences. A worship service at the local Presbyterian seminary, which focused on appreciation and concern for our Jewish neighbors and a Lions Club discussion yesterday about how inclusive we claim to be, but aren't always. Will you pray with me? Oh God, how awesome are all your works. We seek to make a joyful shout to you, making your praise glorious, thanking you that even when we go through fire and water, you bring us out as the psalmist said. Holy Spirit, help us speak beyond the feebleness of our tongues to express the depths of our fears and hopes, our doubts and faith. As we begin a new day and a new week, we see that it's a time for turning. The leaves are turning from green to red to orange the birds are turning south once again. The animals are turning to store their food for the winter. For leaves, birds, and animals, turning becomes is in, instinctive. But for us, oh God, turning does not so easily come. It takes an act of, act of will for us to make a meaningful turn. It means breaking old habits. It means admitting that we've been wrong. And this is never easy for us. It means sometimes losing face and starting all over again. And this is always painful. It means saying, I am sorry. It means recognizing that we have the ability to change if we have the will to change, for you are a God of change and came to our world in human flesh that we might change. This still is terribly hard for us to do, but we know that unless we turn, we will be trapped forever in yesterday's ways. So Lord, help us turn from callousness to sensitivity from hostility to love, from pettiness to purpose, from envy to contentment, from carelessness to discipline, from fear to faith. Turn us around, O Lord, and bring us back toward you. Revive our lives as at the beginning of our love for you and turn us toward each other for in isolation there is no true life. Lord Jesus, let us again hear you say that we are no longer slaves nor strangers, but friends and even children, children of our Heavenly Father, before whom we pray as you have taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. For thine is the, the, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
John 3.16 tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We're not asked to give our children in that way, but we are asked and challenged and enabled to give. We invite you now to participate in the offering that the work of ministry of this church may continue. The usher will serve those of us who are present, those of us who are online. We invite you to send a check or give through Church Center or Venmo. Let us continue in worship with our offering. O Lord, for the will, for the richness of giving, we thank you, asking your blessings on those who give and the gifts themselves, that they may be used fruitfully in ministry to your people near and far. In your holy name we pray, O Lord. Amen. And while you remain standing, Please join us together in hymn 141, Children of the Heavenly Father.
Sunday for the scripture reading after I was supposed to let you sit down for the hymn of preparation. Okay? And the scripture reading is Matthew 25, and I'm not doing it. I think you're on. Or maybe Rob will do it by memory. I would love to read it. Our scripture passage, one of them comes from the Gospel of Matthew, 25th chapter, verses 31 through 40, which will be on the screens in front of you. It says this, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him will sit on his glorious throne, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people from one another. As a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, When did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So thank you, Brother Rob, for reading that because I've got a bunch of other scriptures I'm going to read and I didn't want to lose your attention. So, um, I just want to say thank you for allowing us to come and share the ministry of the Methodist Home. I want to tell you that this ministry is celebrating 151 years. We started a long time ago before there was ever anything like a children's um, services in Kentucky. There were none. And so we and several other denominations realized there was a critical need, and we stepped in. And we stepped in at a time when widows and orphans had, were destitute. And we helped, one by one, change their lives. And so I'm here to tell you that we continue to do that. We are in the business of transforming lives for the better. I am celebrating my 33rd year at the Methodist Home. And I share that with you because this ministry is one that really makes a difference. And it has hooked my heart and my spirit. And I have not been able to find anything that, would, that I could be as passionate about. So I hope when I'm done today, you'll catch a little bit of that fire. Because this is truly life-changing work that God has sent us to do. And we're doing it. So let me tell you first, my message today is messengers of God. And when I talk of that, I'm talking about you and me. All of us have been sent here as messengers of God. And I have evidence from scripture to prove that's true. So I'm going to share with you the scriptures to back up that statement. From James 2, 14 through 17, we are called to action. What good is it, brothers and sisters, If someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, yet does nothing about their physical needs, what good is that? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. And then Mark 10, 45, we're given Christ as the example. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as ransom for many. And then Ephesians 2, 10. God has prepared us to do the good works that he sent us to do. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, 
which God prepared in advance for us to do before we ever came he had a plan for us each individual one of us and then in John 14 12 through 14 we're invited to participate in miracles through prayer and action very truly I tell you whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. And then in James 1.27, we get a specific call to care for widows and orphans. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after widows and orphans in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And then finally, from our social principles of the United Methodist Church, it reads, the United Methodist Church believes God's love for the world is an active and engaged love, a love seeking justice and liberty. We cannot just be the observers, so we care enough about people's lives to risk interpreting God's love, to take a stand, to call each of us into a response, no matter how controversial or complex. In 1948, a United Methodist lady, Miss Anna Dalton, demonstrated her faith in action by becoming a messenger of God's compassion to a little six-year-old girl. That little six-year-old girl had just lost her mother and her father had left she and her four siblings, three of which were infants, behind, alone. And for two weeks, they, they tried to survive on their own before someone realized these children were alone and needed help. So they gathered them up, they took them down to the courthouse, which is what they did back then, and they let the farmers know there are these children that need a home if you'll come and help them. So one by one, people came to the, to the courthouse and they took the different children. But that one little girl, who was my mother, she wasn't chosen because she happened to have already some of the illnesses of malnourishment, rickets. She also had a lazy eye so severe that when she focused, her, the dark of her eye went all the way to the right. So she looked pitiful. And when Miss Anna Dalton got there, she looked, took one look at my mother and knew no one was gonna take her. And even though she had come hoping for a boy to help on the farm, she took my mother in. And in that moment, she changed my mother's life because this woman became the catalyst to changing my mother's life forever. And by changing my mother's life, she also changed mine. One of the things that you may have heard is that children who are resilient are defined as those children who have been able to overcome trauma and yet thrive as adults. And they've found that the one consistent thing that every one of those children have, and this, my mother would be one of those, one caring adult made all the difference. It only took one caring adult. Now, the other children in our family, in, in my mother's sibling group, were not as fortunate as my mother. And some of the people took them in just as servants. So they did not get the nurturing that my mother got and they weren't as resilient. <laughs> Ms. Dalton brought her in and she loved her and she made her feel that she was special. And because of that, my mother learned how to nurture. And because of that, from the moment I was born, I was loved and I've always known that there's somebody in this world who loves me dearly. We at the Methodist home that is our goal, to become those caring adults that transform the lives of kids. 
and we're doing it. We're doing it one child at a time. And the kids who come to us now have histories of extreme trauma. In fact, the majority of the children um, who come to us have had issues of abuse, neglect, abandonment, or some kind of family trauma. And uh, particularly in our residential program, a residential program is the one that cares for the most severely hurting children. They're the ones who have been placed in foster care and have cycled through foster care failing. A lot of times children fail in foster care because they have not yet learned how to trust adults and therefore don't bond well and so the foster parents feel like it, it's not working and they move on. So on average, the children in our residential program have had 20 failed placements. 20 failed placements and they're only teenagers. So imagine how many times you have to cycle through a home and through school and trying to make friends again. So by the time they come to us, they don't believe that we're going to be able to do anything for them. They have no faith and they don't believe that they're worthy. So it's our job to to show them differently. I think one of the best ways for you to get a, a glimpse of what these kids feel is to hear their story. And I'm going to cue up, if you'll play Amy's story for us, we'll hear from, Amy is a former resident and she um, obviously is an adult now because we don't share the kids' stories until they're old enough to give permission and, and participate. So this is Amy's story. story that I can share with you. There are thousands more just like that. Um, we have had a profound difference in the lives of the children we have reached. And we, they come to us with just horrible stories of abuse and neglect. There are times when we as, and, and we, let me say that we provide a professionally trained staff, fully trained therapist, licensed therapist, caseworkers, social workers. We work intensively with these kids to help them stabilize their lives, to find a new path and, and to believe in themselves. But they bring some horrendous stories with them. And yet, and yet, there is still a glimmer of hope in them, be it little, very little, that we nurture 
that life can be better. And that's why we know that God has put us in this work because these, this is what God would have us do. This is what Jesus did, heal, heal. And we do that also through our spiritual life. Uh, one story I want to share with you, you may know already, but every child who comes to the Methodist home gets a quilt. And that is their own quilt to keep forever. And it's interesting because Amy would talk to us when we met with her for this interview about her quilt. All she had was a, a piece of it left because over the years it had frayed. And, but she still had the piece because it meant so much to her. And we tell them that the symbolism of that quilt is that there are always going to be days when you think you're alone. But you're never alone. God is there for you, and God has his people there for you, and all you have to do is reach out. And the example is, are these quilts. Somebody didn't even know you yet, but they prayed for you, they made this quilt for you, and now it's yours to keep to remind you that God is always there. So when you're fearful, when you feel alone, you wrap up and you remember. And it, and it becomes a powerful symbol of our ministry. And so this young lady... This was at our other campus in Owensboro. She came one, one night in the middle of the night to us because her father and mother had had a, a violent fight. She was 14, and her, she saw her mother being brutalized, so she tried to step in and stop her father. And he became enraged, and he literally picked her up and threw her out the door of the house. And by this time, the police had arrived. And so they took her for her own safety out of the home, brought her to our campus. Well, she shared initially she felt that she was being punished somehow because she, why was she taken away and her father... Was, they were just separated. He, he was made to leave, but he didn't go anywhere. He didn't go to jail. He just was made to leave because mom didn't, at that time, didn't want to press charges. And back then, if the, if the woman didn't want to press charges, then it wouldn't, no one would. So she was very angry about that. She'd been there two days, and it happened to be the chapel service where we give out the quilts. And so one of the things at that time we would do is say, okay, um, ladies, gentlemen, come to the quilt closet, pick out your quilt, because later tonight at chapel, you'll be receiving this quilt. So one by one, they, they got, the kids would always get excited picking out their own special quilt. She refused to do it because she didn't want to participate in anything. So one of the counselors just went in and randomly picked one off the shelf. And so later, during chapel, after the service, they began handing out the quilts. They called her forward, and they gave her this quilt that someone had chosen for her. She just went back and sat down, finished the service. And the chaplain looked back, and he saw her clearly sobbing. And so he had all the other kids leave, and the counselor and he sat down with her and, and asked her, what's wrong? And all she could do was hold up this piece of paper and hand it to them through her tears. It was a note that had been attached to the quilt. So the lady who had made the quilt attached a note. And on the note she wrote, With every square, I prayed for you. I prayed that you would know you're not alone, that God loves you. Always know that you're never alone. And it was just the message that she needed in the moment. The counselors had been working with her. Everyone had been working with her. But it was that note from that wonderful lady that was a transformative moment for her. And then she realized this might be a safe place. And that's how we began our ministry with her. Unfortunately, in Kentucky, we continue to be at the top of the percentage of children who are abused in our state. Um, 
We're such a family-centered state, it's just ironic and tragic that we have the, some of the worst child abuse rates in the country. Back before we had a social services system, we United Methodists stepped in to meet a need. And so now there is a great need. And I hope that we can, as believers, unite behind this ministry so that we can continue to grow it and reach more children. One of the wonderful things that we have started in the, since the years since I started is we now do in-home services. We work with families in their own communities all over the state. We're in every county in Kentucky. And last year we served 923 kids. So our residential program is our very smallest program. We are out there right when things are starting to unravel in the families. And as Amy poignantly m mentioned, it doesn't matter how bad your parents are, you still yearn for those parents to be what you want them to be, to love you. So if we can get into those homes and help stabilize that home and help the parents with parenting skill skills and help them learn how to nurture better, and those children never have to be taken out of their home, that is transformative and wonderful work. And so we're doing that. We want to expand that. And we want to have a full continuum. So for kids who are early on needing intervention, and then for those after all everything, all the interventions have failed in our residential program to reach them. When we think about children in Kentucky, it has to be those of us in the faith community who step up because the social services system does not ever seem to be able to step up and do all they need to do. In fact, the cost of care for the children in our residential program is not paid for completely. We, we do receive state money, but it's not enough to cover the cost. So it's our fifth Sunday offering, like today, that has made the difference. And you know, one of the reasons that the Methodist home has been to, able to survive when other homes have had to close is because our, our believers stood behind us and, and supported us. There were people who remembered us in their wills, who gave those fifth Sunday offerings, who gave their time as volunteers. So many ways that we have shown ourselves to be God's messengers through this ministry. So I want to challenge you to think, how is it, not only through the Methodist home, but how is God calling you to start making a difference for children in Kentucky? Because we can do it right here in our community, and we can do it through our Methodist home. We can, if we prioritize it, we can transform this system, because we did it. We did it back right after the Civil War. We can't keep relying on social services to do it. They don't seem to be able to, to get it done. They don't, there are not enough resources. Those poor social workers work so hard. There's just not enough of them. And so we have to help fill in that. So prayerfully think about that. The other thing I ask you to do is, is to come alongside the Methodist home, make a new commitment to do that, because we really need you going forward. If you don't already receive our newsletter, I hope you'll sign up. There are these little papers out on the tables. You can fill it in, and you can just note there that you want to receive the children's voice. You can also go online at kyumh.org and sign up there as well. And then when you sign up for this children's voice, there's some out on the table if you'd like them. In every issue, there's a story of one of our kids, now adults, and how the Methodist home has changed their life. It's important for you to know that because you are a part of that ministry. And then I also ask that you consider putting the Methodist home staff and children on your permanent prayer list. Because over the 33 years, we have had difficult times. We have trans we've been able to make it through those difficult times 
And I know it has been because of the prayers of, of thousands of Methodists who have made it a priority to make the children's home part of their family, part of their prayer list. So I hope you'll do that. And when this newsletter comes out, one other thing I want to say about that. It only comes out four times a year, although next year we have five fifth Sundays, but four or five times, that's it. So we're not going to blow up your mailbox with a lot of junk, so don't worry about that. We won't do that, I promise you that. And um, there are also ways to sign up online. We do send a few more notices online, but we also share great stories there, so I hope you'll think about that as well. So <clears throat> in closing, I just want to say to you that we thank you. This church has been very active in the ministry of supporting the Methodist home. Thank you for that. You are a part of changing lives in Kentucky. And, and these children are the very ones that God would have us serve. They are literally the least of these. They're the ones that others have abandoned, that others have given up on, and we are stepping in there and changing their lives. And by doing that, just like in the case of my mother, we not only changed their life, but we changed the lives of their children and their children's children. That's God's work. Oftentimes when the kids know that it's my job to share the stories with you, they want me to tell you what they think about the Methodist home. So I'm going to share an excerpt from one of my favorite notes that the kids wrote. Please tell them that the Methodist home staff have made me feel secure and wanted. It's not just the counselors that are here for you. You have friends, teachers, cooks. At one time or other, I've needed every one of them to remind me that I'm not alone in this world. Now I know that I am somebody. Now I know that I am somebody. Thank you for your part in that. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you that you first loved us. And we ask, Lord, that you show us how, right here in our own community, we can be more active in reaching children in need. Because we know, indeed, Lord, that you bless us when we follow your will. Lord, may this day be one in which your blessings are clear and abundant to us. Help us to greet those blessings with gratitude and notice. And we thank you for the love in our lives that we've been given. And now help us to share it with others. In your precious name, amen. Can we give Melinda a round of applause, please? Thank you for sharing. Those tremendous stories of impact with us. We really appreciate you spending time with us this morning. Um, of course, she'll be after she gives the benediction, she'll follow me out. And so uh, if you'd like to spend some time with her, ask her some questions, hear some more stories, sign up for those new newsletters, she's available for you. And so I encourage you to do that. Last night, you'll stand as you are able as we sing uh, this morning's closing hymn, our hymn of response, Hosanna, loud Hosanna, found United Methodist Hymnal 278, and of course, on the screens in front of you. Let's shout this with joy.
morning, everyone. I would like to announce that the pumpkins are here and to be sure to sign up for a shift to sell pumpkins. We sell them every day. Monday through Friday hours are 12 to 6 o'clock. Saturdays, or Saturday hours are 10 to 6. And Sunday hours are also 12 to 6. Proceeds support the Native American growers and walk-ins mission partners. The pumpkins were unloaded yesterday by church members, the youth, and our Boy Scouts. This will be my fourth year helping uh, with unloading pumpkins, and I love helping every year, and I think you will too. Thank you. And now may the love of God so fill your heart that you can't help but share it into this world. Take it into this world and take, show the world that we are loving people. In your precious name, 